Students, welcome back to developmental biology course. Um, so, we will continue from the floral development in um, uh, angiosperms where we left in the last class. So, in the last class I was explaining uh, how the different uh, stimuli control the floral flower in uh, formation in uh, angiosperms that is um, you know light signal autonomous programs as well as um, uh, plant hormones all of them play a role in uh, converting the vegetative uh, meristem into flow inflorescence meristem and instead of producing leaves and branches, now the inflorescence meristem will initiate formation of uh, floral meristems. Okay. So, that is uh, explained in this cartoon which I went through in the last class. Uh, very briefly, signals such as light sensed by different plant organs, although in this cartoon it show it is prominently pointing to the leaves. Uh, generates a signal like uh, flowering locust T, which uh, translocates to the tip and associates with transcription factor like FD and initiates the expression of floral meristem identity genes such as leafy and apetalo. Okay, and in the meantime, the terminal flower formation, which is normally inhibited, now. Uh, that becomes inflorescence meristem. So, now we are going to uh, go further from uh, the induction of floral uh, meristem identity genes, how they turn on the floral organ identity genes. In the last class, we saw um, that the mutations in uh, floral meristem identity genes such as leafy and apetala create phenotypes where the floral organs are essentially transformed into leaf or leaf like structures. So, so this is the apetala 1 and cauliflower double mutant where you have inflorescence meristems repeatedly forming instead of floral meristems giving a cauliflower like look uh, appearance. And I also told that the floral meristem genes activate um, uh, region specifying genes which control the boundaries of expression of the floral organ identity genes. So, today we are going to focus on what are the floral organ identity genes and how do they function. So, the floral identity genes belong to three broad categories called uh, a, B and C groups and the model to explain how the organs are uh, determined is called the A, B, C system okay, or the A, B, C model. So, it is quite simple, uh, if we look at it, you, you have class A genes. So, in a certain region within the flower primordium. Uh, if class A alone is expressed, it is going to become a sepal, like for example, the outer wall, okay. uh, it is a concentric circle, circles in which the different organs are specified. The outermost forms the uh, sepals or the calyx and then you have the corolla which forms the petals, then you have the stamen and then you have the carpal. So, these are the four concentric circles or walls, W H O R L wall. Um, so, if A alone expressed, then it is going to become sepal or uh, like the outer one and if A B are expressed like the next uh, concentric circle, it is going to form petals and uh, if uh, B and C are expressed, it is going to be stamen and if C alone, then it is going to be calyx. So, this how such an overlap uh, could be there becomes obvious when we consider this sort of a cartoon. So, you have A alone, A B in this, B C and then C. So, this is wild type forming sepal, petal, stamen and carpal. Okay. So, now if you have a mutation like a petal or 2, where you do not have A expressed, 
now C extends into all the layers. Now we know C alone means carpal and that is what ends up happening in the outermost, the carpal forms where you should actually get sepals. Okay. In the calyx wall you have the carpal and then B C will be stamen like normally in the third one whatever happens now in the second and third uh, is normal and the fourth is also normal in this. And the same you have uh, in uh, B mutants when you do not have B group gene function then you have sepal, sepal, carpal, carpal because you do not have the B A to make the petals or B C to make the stamen. So, instead you have sepal, sepal, carpal as seen in these two images. Okay. And if you do not have C then you make sepal, petal, petal, sepal. Okay. So, instead you can see the green calyx forming and then you have the petal, petal in uh, both where you should normally get petal as well as stamen. So, so this is the ABC model that explains how the organ identities in the four walls are determined. Okay. So, if A alone to reiterate it is sepal, A B you are going to get petal, B C carpal and C carpal. So, uh, I, although this model is very simple and explains to a great extent it does not explain everything. For example, if you express all the three groups of genes in leaf, leaf does not get converted into flower. So, obviously, there are other genes involved and one such group is called the sepaleta genes. So, there are three paralogs uh, sepaleta 1, 2 and 3 and if you remove all of them what happens is you get sepal in all of them. So, these genes function in conjunction with these ABC genes to actually determine the wild type. So, if you remove uh, sepaleta genes then you do not get petal stamen although you have B A or the B C combination correctly. So, in addition to that you need the sepaleta group genes to form the normal organs. And if ectopically expressed the sepaleta genes can convert leaf into a uh, petal uh, sorry sepal and that is why it is called sepaleta complete our discussion on plant development. So, what we have seen here is like the way genetic mutants in uh, simple organisms like uh, C. elegans and Drosophila helped us to identify uh, the master regulators and get a, a framework for thinking about and uh, investigating development in animals. In plants again very similarly genetic mutants isolated in Arabidopsis helps uh, helped us understand uh, some of the basic pro, uh, uh, basic genes and a framework for thinking about the development of plant organs. Okay. So, uh, with this now we switch to uh, early development in mammals and that is what is our next topic. So, so we are unlike uh, the embryonic development that we saw in Drosophila in mammalian development it is more complex. Uh, the primary uh, reasons are listed here uh, one of them is it is extremely small like a human zygote is about 1000 the size of frog egg and the another major complication comes from the fact that embryonic development happens inside another organism. Okay. So, the embryo develops deep within the tissue layers of tissues in the uh, mother's um, you know body it, and that makes it harder to access the embryo unlike the uh, embryos laid out uh, like in the case of Drosophila or external fertilization in some of the animals such as um, fish or amphibian. So, here uh, the material is not readily accessible. Uh, the, the, bo, this is primarily coming from the fact that the mammalian embryonic development uh, draws uh, extensive amount of nutrients and other supports from the 
uh, mother's body so that the embryo can be significantly sophisticated uh, in terms of uh, its uh, functions. Okay. So, so a, a sophisticated development uh, of complex structures definitely um, you know is limited by stored resources and therefore a continuous availability of resource from the mother uh, helps the embryo to become more sophisticated and adapt to um, you know different uh, selection pressures and that is the primary thing about mammalian development that we are going to keep in mind. Okay. So, there is lot of continuous supply of nutrients from the mother and therefore, lot of anatomical and morphological adaptations uh, to uh, you know suit this uh, unique situation. And uh, mammals do, do not produce a lot of uh, embryos in one go, they produce a few zygote. Okay. So, some maximum a, a dozen and no more than that. If you take human beings, it is almost always one at a time. And the coming to the embryo itself, the cleavage is slow, each division takes a lot longer than other organisms. And the cleavage plane changes from one cell division cycle to the next one and therefore, we call this is rotational cleavage. So, we will see a cartoon representation of that in the next slide. And it is asynchronous, it is not like 2 becomes 4 becomes 8 becomes 16 and so on. So, when one blastomere is uh, un, in metaphase, another one may still be in the previous interface. Okay. So, they are asynchronous, not all cells of the embryo divide at the same time. Um, another unique feature of the mammalian embryo is compaction. So, initially the blastomeres are loosely uh, adhering to each other in within the um, uh, eggshell equivalent called zona pellucida, but later they come together and form uh, cell junctions like cadaverine based junctions as well as um, outermost forming tight junctions uh, and that process is called compaction. Uh, and lastly, uh, unlike uh, in invertebrate embryonic development as well as in uh, even in the case of amphibians, here where the maternal products that is the proteins and mRNA produced and deposited in the oocyte by the mother, uh, there they play a great role in embryonic development. So, unlike that situation in uh, mammals, the zygotic transcriptional activation happens very early and um, they pl play a prominent role in embryonic development. Okay. So, we will see them uh, to see, uh, in some detail as we move along. Okay, this gives you, a, you know, a, an orientation to the anatomy where it all happens. So, this is the ovary and this is the oviduct. And this oviduct modifying into a large body called uterus is one of those anatomical morphological ana adaptations required for uh, the extensive association between the developing embryo and the mother. Okay. So, so uh, upon ovulation, the fimbriae helps in uh, the oocytes coming out of the ovary to uh, you know migrate via the oviduct. This uh, region closer to this play uh, ovary is called the ampulla and that is where fertilization happens as you see in this cartoon here. And this uh, once fertilization is complete then meiosis uh, ensues and meiosis completes then starts the first cleavage. So, as it is migrating it is going through the cleavages. Okay. So, during all these phases, uh, the outer layer called the zona pellucida, which plays a critical role in fertilization for the sperm entry, uh, protects the embryo from implanting on the oviduct. Okay. So, uh, the implantation is a new word here, implantation meaning 
uh, attachment of the embryo to the mother's uh, body and sets up a conduit for nutritional flow and that happens only here in the uterus okay between the uh, outer layers of the embryo and the epithelial lining of uterus called endometrium so we will see that uh, in detail later and only here this adherence should happen um, and having it happen here does not permit embryonic development because this is anatomically a narrow region and leads to hemorrhage leading to uh, often uh, death of the mother. So, this if, if it happens it is called tubal pregnancy and that is often fatal and that is prevented by this zona pellucida layer and uh, as the as it moves first cleavage then second and so on and then finally it comes to the uterus and where it gets implanted ok. So, this is anatomical overview. So, we will get into the details and the molecules involved as we proceed further ok. So, this tells you about the rotational cleavage. So, in amphibian uh, what you see is we, we did not get into the amphibian uh, uh, embryonic development for want of time. Um, so, we skipped that and we directly moved into the mammalian development in amphibian the first division as well as second division both as shown by these two plate like structures happen longitudinally that is in this particular cartoon top to bottom axis. Whereas, in mammals the first cleavage is like that, but the second cleavage for one blastomere it is the same longitudinal or meridional cleavage and the second one happens horizontal or equatorial cleavage. So, this is what we call as rotational cleavage ok first meridional then second one of the blastomeres that is 2a meridional while the other one equatorial ok. So, this is the ro rotational cleavage although this pattern happens uh, this is not really critical for the embryonic development because the later embryo comes from any of these cells and uh, there are no cytoplasmic partitioning of maternal determinants to any specific blastomere. So, none of the four are determined to become the future germline ok uh, like the cells that form the gametes and at the same time any of the four can actually become. So, you have regulative development happening here uh, which we learnt earlier and as a result these cleavage patterns although they happen and this is characteristic of mammals they are not critical for embryonic development ok. So, here we have the microscopic images of the actual embryo. So, this is the first cleavage, second cleavage and the third here you have 8 cells. So, at this stage the, M, the blastomeres are loosely packed within zona pellucida ok. So, from here they go through a process of compaction where they the cells come together and attach to each other and the outer layer of cells form tight junctions that is membrane fusions. So, therefore, the inside of this uh, stage called uh, morula the next one is called morula the 16 cell stage uh, is uh, sealed off from the outside ok membrane membrane fusion tight junction means you cannot have any liquid flow from outside to inside across the tight junction and the cells inside form uh, gap junctions allowing um, you know uh, transport of ions uh, among the inner cells and that is how we get to the 16 cell stage called the morula and uh, at later stage of this we have separation of two cell layers this is the first uh, sort of differentiation that happens the inner cells form what is called inner cell moss and the outer layer uh, forms what is called trophoblast and this trophoblast is the one that is going to be crucial for this attachment here implantation and the inner cell moss is the one from which we get the entire embryo ok. So, this is how this separation happens. So, the trophoblast is an anatomical specialization from the embryo's uh, part to establish the mother fetal 
connection for the uh, nutrient uh, to flow from the mother to the fetus and the waste products to be removed from the fetus to the mother uh, system. Okay. So, the trophoblast is going to produce a differentiated cells and finally contribute to the structure called chorion. Do not worry about the spelling for the word, it is coming a couple of slides later. And uh, the chorion undergoes different uh, you know, extensive morphological changes and becomes the embryonic part of a structure called the placenta. Okay. And mother also contributes to the placenta uh, part and that part is called the decidua. So, decidua from the endometrial lining here and the uh, trophoblast derived cells forming the chorion. The decidua and chorion together form the placenta and establish the connection between the two. So, the inner cell mass is the one that is actually going to produce all the rest of the cell types uh, forming the complete embryo. So, at this stage uh, the, the cells before this stage any of the cells for example, at this stage any of these cells could have become trophoblast or inner cell mass and therefore, these blastomias are called totipotent because they have the ability to generate all cell types of the embryo and the trophoblast as well. While the inner cell mass buried within this while giving rise to all other uh, cell types of the embryo, it does not produce trophoblast as a result they are not called uh, totipotent, instead they are called pluripotent because they have the ability to make multiple cell types and that is why that pluri uh, uh, you know prefix. So, uh, till then there are no uh, fluid filled space among the cells and that starts to form in the next process called the cavitation where the cells start producing um, you know uh, 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 ion channels that are going to uh, secrete uh, potassium into among um, interstitial space. Um, sorry sodium into the interstitial space and due to that uh, to balance the osmotic pressure the water flows in and leading to the uh, cavity that is filled with the fluid and that we call as blastocele. Okay. And at this stage the embryo is called blastula and when the inner cell mass moves to one uh, portion of this uh, area. Uh, like as you see here it is called blasto, blastocyst. So, till then it is called blastula and when the inner cell mass moves to one part of this fluid filled uh, trophoblast surrounded structure uh, then we call the blasto, blastula into blast, blastocyst. So, this is a cross section of a blastocyst where the inner cell mass is not distributed equally everywhere instead it is on one place. And this is actually a vestigial uh, uh, leftover of the way embryo develops on top of yolk sac in for example, in birds and amphibian. Because birds as well as mammals uh, arose from reptilian ancestors and in reptiles this um, yolk sac is quite prominent and the nutrition from the yolk is important you know it does not have placental connection and therefore, the embryo develops on top of it. And a very similar thing the mammalian embryo also goes through although it does not um, you know store a whole lot as yolk sac. Okay. So, this is a, a developmental uh, it is a historical process rather than an actual requirement for the mammalian embryonic development. So, so once it reaches this stage, so now we are actually uh, getting here. So, this layer should uh, be removed. So, essentially the layer does not get removed instead a hole is poked and the embryo kind of hatches. Okay and that is what is shown here. 
So, proteases are secreted uh, by the embryo, uh, probably the trophoblast or uh, you know digest like a trypsin like protease secreted by the trophoblast digest a hole in the zona pellucida which was preventing premature implantation that I explained earlier and the embryo comes out. So, this is a cross section showing such uh, blastocysts in the mouse or um, you know ovary uh, sorry in the uterus it is coming there and here it, this is in a monkey where you see implantation early stage of implantation trophoblast and this is the fluid um, filled blastocyl and here is the inner cell mass and uh, here you see the adherence. And this adherence is a quite extensive and complex and sequential process. So, in this uh, both the trophoblast uh, cells as well as the endometrial cells play a major role and there is a in a conversation between the two. So, initially the corpus luteum uh, left after the uh, egg comes out of the follicle, the leftover of the follicle is the corpus luteum. Hormones produced by that induces the endometrium um, to produce the sulfated polysaccharides to which the L-selectin you know, which is a lectin kind of protein present on the trophoblast attached to them. So, L-selectin uh, sulfated polysaccharide forms a more stable attachment. Okay. So, initial uh, attachment is not uh, it is sort of wobbly and that happens between the uh, initial interaction between the ECM of the two, uh, but uh, more stable interaction ensues. Uh, initially L selectin sulfated polysaccharides that is followed by production of integrin uh, by the uh, trophoblast which interact with collagen in the ECM of the endometrium uh, as well as fib uh, not just collagen uh, these integrins interact with fibronectin as well as laminin. And this leads to uh, the next step of interaction where you have P categorines in which we learnt a long time ago when we learnt about uh, um, you know morphogenesis. Uh, and these uh, categories uh, play a role as well. And once this estab uh, uh, you know stable interaction is established, then uh, wind pr proteins produced uh, by both tissues induce trophoblast to produce pro uh, proteases that is going to digest the in ECM of that is the extracellular matrix of the uh, endometrium allowing the embryo to burrow into the uterus wall, okay, uterine wall and that is what is actually the implantation. Okay. So, the embryo gets buried into the uterine wall and that is where it is going to develop. So, actually the embryo develops not in the uterus uh, lumen, instead it is going to get buried into this layer of cells this wall uterine wall and that is where the embryo is going to develop. So, um, so we will uh, focus on this um, nutritional you know supply part. So, as I told you uh, I am reiterating the same again in this slide mammalian embryo obtains nutrients from the mother and that requires these anatomical changes. Uh, expansion of OV duct into uterus and then uh, so that is the change from the mother's part and fetal organs uh, that is the formation of chorion as well as the uterine uh, cells derived decidua. These two have no other role except the, uh, to uh, support the fetal development and that is why we call them as fetal organ. They are organs specific during the fetal development. Okay. So, these are the anatomical changes that are required for uh, this process. Okay. So, we will see the implantation along with the embryonic development with, because both happen simultaneously. So, 
at an early stage uh, like a seven day old blastocyst if you look at this uh, so this is the inner cell mass blastocyst again trophoblast here so you have uh, cells uh, two kinds of cells here in the inner cell mass one is hypoblast and the other one is epiblast we will see what these two are going to form as we move along the main point here is as you see in the two color uh, coded uh, staining um, this gata 6 is a transcription factor specific to hypoblast and nanog is a transcription factor specific to epiblast and the both kinds of cells are intermingled here they have not separated into uh, for example two layers so they are mixed but later they are going to get separated into two layers as you see in this cartoon uh, the one that uh, you know abounds the blastocele is going to be the hypoblast and the one uh, on the opposite side is the epiblast so the entire embryo actually develops from the epiblast okay so we saw setting apart the trophoblast then i said the inner cell mass is the one from which embryo is going to form now the inner cell mass has separated into epiblast and hypoblast. Now epiblast is the one from which embryo is going to form. Hypoblast is going to form a lining here uh, forming what is called uh, extra embryonic endoderm that we will see as we go along. Um, then this actually is going to again separate into two layers. One is going to line a cavity that is going to form here. Remember this is blastocele, this is also a fluid filled cavity. But for embryonic development and later on this cavity that is going to form amnionic cavity is going to be uh, important. This is going to enlarge and is going to become a fluid filled sac called the amnion and the amnionic fluid uh, acts as a shock absorber for the developing fetus and that is going to be lined by uh, cells coming from this epiblast and they are called going to be called the amnionic ectoderm and embryonic epiblast the other portion will be the one from which embryo is going to form. So we had ECM becoming epiblast and hypoblast and epiblast is going to become amnionic ectoderm and embryonic epiblast okay. And in the meantime, the trophoblast is going to differentiate into cytotrophoblast, which again later is going to produce another type called the syncytiotrophoblast. So, the syncytiotrophoblast is the one that actually establishes extensive contact with the uh, uterine wall and finally going to draw the uh, blood vessels, mother's blood supply to the embryo and form a connection, which we will see later. So, these structures are now more obvious here. The hypoblast, uh, you know, delaminated from this layer and now has migrated, forming a lining of the yolk sac, and this is going to be the yolk sac, okay. Although yolk is not critical for food supply for the embryonic development. So, that is going to happen through this forming the plus, uh, you know, the uh, chorionic uh, structure. And uh, this is the amnionic ectoderm that arose from this uh, epiblast and this is the embryonic epiblast, okay. So you can already see uh, these uh, structures forming, these are important going to make connection with this to draw, Th these are going to produce molecules that signal the development of growing of the blood vessels, mother's blood vessels towards the structure and then finally they are going to form a structure, uh, the placenta and the different layers of that we will learn in um, the next class, we will not have time to complete them today. So today what we are going to do uh, is going to focus on the molecular uh, events that happen in setting apart inner cell mass and trophoblast, the first important uh, differentiation event that happens. This drawing is that we see that the blood vessels merging into the 
syncytiotrophoblast layer as well as the extra embryonic uh, endoderm having developed from this hypoblast. And then you start seeing extra embryonic mesoderm that also comes from this embryonic epiblast. So, the mesoderm starts to form and this is also going to be crucial to form the um, fetal uh, blood vessel connection uh, in establishing the uh, placenta. So, so, this summarizes all the four steps that we just uh, went through. So, now, uh, so this summarizes the lineage, you know, uh, of whatever we have learned so far from blastocyst. So, in blastula, blastula is when that cavity has formed, blastocyl has formed and when the inner cell mass uh, moves towards one end of that, we call blastocyst. From that, you have tropo, uh, trophoblast, that is the outer cells and then the inner cell uh, mass is going to be the inner cell mass that gives rise to hypoblast and epiblast. And I uh, just now we saw in the cartoon hypoblast how it gives rise to extra embryonic endoderm, yolk sac and then epiblast forming the amnionic ectoderm and ep embryonic epiblast. And so, here this color coding uh, shows you which is the extra embryonic tissue meaning they do not contribute to the embryo proper. Okay. So, none of the body uh, parts of yours comes from uh, these tissues that were there when you were an embryo. So, all of you come from this part. Okay. So, that is why it is embryonic tissue. So, embryonic epiblast which uh, gives rise to embryonic ectoderm. So, this we have not yet gone into. Okay? So, we will see this later uh, when we get into gastrulation. So, today we will not get into gastrulation. Instead, we are going to focus on the molecular events that lead to the separation of these two. So, that is summarized in the next couple of uh, slides. So, initially at the morula stage, um, the cells express, all cells express this uh, transcription factor called CDX2. But later when trophoblast ECM separate, CDX2 is expressed only in, in the trophoblast along with this um, U mesodermine another uh, transcription factor. And they are not expressed in cells that are going to become ICM. So, so, how this uh, inner cell mass and trophoblast uh, separation of this gene expression pattern happens um, is what is explained uh, in this slide and in the subsequent slides. So, uh, before we go into finding out what uh, stops CDX2 expression in cells that are going to become ICM, uh, let us see what these molecules drawn here actually do. So, CDX2 expressed in trophoblast inhibits uh, OCT4 expression and OCT4 uh, what it does is it um, the cells in which OCT4 is expressed are going to become the ICM which are going to produce this TAT3 and that is going to be uh, required for self renewal of these cells. Okay? The more of those inner cell mass cells are going to be produced by the action of STAT3. So, OCT4 then let later STAT3 are required for that. And in the next step, NANOG is another protein. This is also transcription factor. This again is suppressed by CDX2. So, neither of these two are going to be expressed in trophoblast. And NANOG is going to induce these ICM cells to become epiblast okay and nanog is not going to allow hypoblast okay the this sort of shape indicates suppression arrow indicates induction in all uh, you know uh, aspects of developmental biology diagrams so nanog suppresses hypoblast formation in the earlier step oct4 oct4 similarly inhibits trophoblast formation and OCT4, NANOG, STAT3, all three together are essential for the stemness of the embryonic uh, stem cells in epiblast. So, the stem cells that we take out of embryo 
and if we culture in a way the expression of these three are maintained, they are the embryonic stem cells which can be used uh, for uh, you know differentiating different kinds of um, uh, tissues, the differentiated structures. Okay. So, that is where the ES cells that you might have heard popularly come from. So, these are the cells coming from the epiblast maintaining the expression of these three transcription factors. So, here is the structure of an embryo uh, shown uh, IC, uh, ICM here with the OCT4 expression that is the, the color is the OCT4 expression and these are the hypoblast cells the green color ones and here you have the integrin um, protein expression indicated by the blue and these are the trophoblast cells. Okay. So, now let us see why CDX2 does not express here in the cells uh, that are going to become ICM. So, those are the cells that are present inside and these are the cells present outside. This inside outside difference seem to be the cue for the differential gene expression here. Okay. So, that is uh, shown in this summary cartoon, but we will see in some detail uh, in the expanded version of the same. So, um, so we already know OCT4 suppresses CDX2. So, here we saw that. Um, so, CDX2 expression is actually induced by a transcription factor called TED4. And this TED4 is expressed in all cells at the merula stage and it is uh, located in the nucleus bound to the promoter of CDX2, but does not activate CDX2 expression in the ICM cells and it, uh, it does activate only in the trophoblast. Okay. And it also induces the other uh, transcription factors that are re required for the trophic trodom formation. So, why does this not activate CDX2 in the ICM cells? That is because the ICM cells having uh, you know uh, gap junction on, on all sides uh, which is sensed that attachment on all sides is sensed by the hippo pathway and that pathway activates a protein called the LATS that ubiquitinates another protein called AP and promotes its degradation. Okay. And as a result AP does not go into the nucleus and associate with the TED4. And uh, you know experimentally it has been seen that the AP is lo localized to the nucleus only in the trophoblast cells and not in this. And in the trophoblast on the other hand the hippo signaling uh, is not active presumably due to cell polarity because here this side is not connected to another layer of cells as you see here. So, here you have an apical basal polarity in this cell and that presumably inhibits this hippo pathway. As a result LATS does not get phosphorylated and active and that does not go and um, sorry LATS does not get activated and phosphorylated YAP and only phosphorylated YAP gets degraded and the unphosphorylated one is not targeted for degradation and therefore, it is available to migrate into the nucleus where it associates with TED4. This is why so TED4 requires you remember transcription factors acting combinatorially. So, here is another example of that. So, YAP, TED4 when they both are together then only the downstream uh, targets get transcribed. So, here without the YAP TED4 does not activate. So, this is the reason CDX2 is expressed only in the uh, trophoblast and the rest are consequences of that. So, the rest of the things that we saw here. Um, so, now, CDX2 is not expressed uh, in these cells due to that and as a result they activate OCT4 and OCT4 is going to suppress CDX2 and this mutual antagonism between these two 
reinforces the suppression of the trophoblast and uh, ECM, uh, sorry, ICM and they remain separate. Okay. So, so that is, uh, that is uh, how the inner cell mass trophoblast separation is controlled by sensing this epical basal polarity Q that is formed by um, what we saw here. Okay, so, the outer cells that formed tight junctions and the inner cell mass that formed gap junctions and remained inside, this uh, is sensed and translated into differential expression of transcription factors and that tra differential expression of transcription factors drive all these um, you know changes that we are seeing here. Okay. So, this completes our description of uh, early embryonic uh, development up to gastrulation. So, tomorrow we will continue on the mammalian embryonic development starting from gastrula. Okay.